Alleluia! Christ is risen! The Lord is risen <coughs> Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, who through your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, overcame death and opened to us the gate of everlasting life, grant that we who celebrate with joy the day of the Lord's resurrection may be raised from the death of sin by your life-giving Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him 
receives forgiveness of sins through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Colossians. Since you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. The word of the Lord.
Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw, that the linen wrap, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them, that he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord.
When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I, I wonder, did we ever know the vocabulary of wonder, love, and grace? If so, I seem to have forgotten it in these latter days. We are, you and I, so much creatures of our own time. What we see, what we feel, what we know in the present is the sum of our existence. It's the sum of our possibility and the whole vocabulary that we learn to employ. Even those who dream, visionaries, musicians, the writers of science fiction, poets, theologians, finally are subject to the critique of the possible in their own time. The authority of experience has helped the leaders of every age dissect the transcendent into fragments of quantifiable truth held in common only by mutual testimony. Although I'm certain that he and other theoretical physicists would not appreciate it, I believe there's a direct line to be drawn between Max Planck, the father of quantum physics, and the reality TV shows that have kept the networks afloat in recent years. Both would deconstruct the present experience before them in the name of understanding and truth, if not secondarily entertainment. There's no place in their worlds for a thing or an experience or a sequence of events to mean more or become more than the sum of its parts. For example, the rainbow cannot both be a sign from God that the world would never again be destroyed by water and at the same time simply form an optical illusion created by the interaction of sunlight, moisture, and the neuroscience of sight. Similarly, and please forgive me, if Maury Povich has anything to say about it, the determination of your baby daddy <laughs> cannot both take into account the backstory and the lab results. We're so much creatures of our own time. I don't simply want to say that we've squeezed the, squeezed the mystery out of life, though it's true that mystics and poets struggle, especially in those seasons when the public relies on the expert to parse the matter at hand. Still, it's bigger than this. If we ever knew the vocabulary of wonder, love, and grace, we've long since exchanged it for the presumed certainty of white coats, green cards, and the red-blue designation that sweeps the nation once every four years. It's a way of life that we've either forfeited or never had. The way that allows me to see as God sees. The way that allows me to love as God loves. To hope as God hopes. To dream as God dreams. Either we've never known how or we've forgotten how. Just a little over six weeks ago, I had finished a time with a couple preparing for, for marriage. And we'd finished our premarital counseling session, stepped into the hallway outside my office, and they were, they were trying to tend to the pastor, to care for the pastor. They asked me how I was doing and, and how the, the Lenten season was, was coming up for me. Was, was I holding up? And I said, oh, I, I love this time of year, Lenten, Easter. In fact, I said, I tell time by the resurrection. Boy, that phrase has come back to haunt me so much these last six weeks. I've thought about that so many times, and, and I fear that I told an untruth. I, I don't. 
I don't tell time by the resurrection. You think I might have picked that up along the way, occupational hazard and all, but I, 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 I don't tell time by the resurrection. I want to so much. I, I, I want to tell time by the resurrection, but I don't. Instead, I tell time by the number of appointments I have in a day, the number of hours that I'm at work. I, I tell time by the number of days until Friday rolls round again, maybe in quieter moments, the number of years I've been married. At times, I'll tell time by the decades since my youngest's birth. Occasionally, I'll tell time by what's left of my life, but only rarely do I tell time by the resurrection. So, our story of the empty tomb this morning, it's a short essay that means to teach us, as the disciples were taught on that first day of the empty tomb, how to tell time by the resurrection. Mary's first on the scene. And though the other Gospels fill in the blanks a bit more for us, we're not exactly sure why Mary's come here in John. Surely she's grieving. Perhaps she wanted to say one more prayer. Perhaps there was one more spice to be added to the many that had been used to prepare his body for burial. But one thing is for sure, nails in the hands, nails in the feet, spear in the side, he's dead. And that was it. She's coming back to the tomb to mourn the death of her Lord. That's what happens when you breathe your last. You die, and the best you can do after that is pray and mourn. That being the case, her response is completely predictable. The stone's been rolled away and she fears the worst. Breathless, she seeks out Simon Peter and John. They've stolen his body. They've stolen his body. It's gone. He's, he's, not, he's not there. This is the response of one who does not expect resurrection. This is the response of, of one who cannot connect the power of Christ's life to the victory of the cross. A dead body stays dead. A dead body turns to dust. If it moves, if it's gone, then someone moved it. They've stolen his body. Peter and John, they're caught up similarly. The excitement, they, they run to the tomb to, to check out the situation. They, they then return home, just breezing past Mary, presumably to speak to other disciples. They come and go with news to report, namely that his body is gone. But, but Mary finds herself alone again at the tomb and crying. She finally musters what it takes to step to the door of the tomb and to look in. You can only assume that she believes she might see the confirmation that was needed to satisfy the curiosity of Peter and John. Angels greet her. Now these aren't just any angels. If, they're, if they are messengers from God, as they are in other parts of Scripture, she doesn't recognize them as such. She doesn't afford them that kind of respect. She doesn't respond to them with fear. She doesn't bow down before them and lie prostrate. She, she has no sense that the world is turning upside down. Why are you crying, they ask. And responding like one caught in a trap, maybe like a widow deeply captured by her grief. They've taken the body of my Lord, she says. They, they've taken his body. There's no consoling her. There's no teaching her of the new creation in this moment. She did not expect resurrection. Not now, and she will not begin telling time by it. So there's one more try. There she is continuing in her grief. And the text then says that she turns and that as she turns, she sees Jesus. Only she doesn't see him. She doesn't recognize him. Bound by what she knows to be true, the death of her Lord, bound by the dust that a dead body becomes, she will not see Jesus. And I thought even just in that moment, as, as Dolores read the gospel lesson, I thought, oh, oh, to have the eyes of God 
in that moment. Oh, oh, to have the love of God, the hope of God. Oh, oh, to dream as God dreams in that moment. But Jesus says, you're crying. Why? As if to plead with her. And, and now she confuses Jesus for the grave robber. She's so certain has taken her Lord's body. Just let me know where you've put him. Please let me come and take care of him, she says to Jesus. She's so much a creature of her own time. Though the resurrection has taken place, the ability of the disciples and of Mary in particular to begin to tell time by the resurrection, to begin to speak with the vocabulary of the resurrection, to see with the eyes of God, to hope with the heart of God, these have yet to come. And for Mary, it comes when he speaks her name, Mary. His voice cuts through the confusion and the illusion of truth that she had embraced. The dead do not speak, yet she hears a voice. The dead do not move from their resting places, yet Jesus stands before her. Now, now the resurrection begins to break in on her. Now she begins to tell time by the resurrection, risking first a testimony with the other disciples. I've seen him. I've seen the risen Lord. She hears her name from the one who made her and begins to understand by faith that the world as she knew it is not the world as God dreamed it. And now she can do no other but to run, to tell all, and to live by resurrection time. Late in his tenure as the Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams made a pastoral visit to the Diocese of Winchester. And there he had a time of gathering for clergy and laity and addressed them on matters of the faith, focusing specifically on the teaching and doctrine of the resurrection. And he offered these words in the course of his teaching that day. He said, the resurrection is what prompts into existence that new language that Christians speak in their words and in their actions. The resurrection is the ground of how we make sense of what we do and what we say. Do you see this? Do, do you see how nothing in Mary's world between the cross and the grave made sense until the reality of the resurrection had broken in on her and Jesus had spoken her name. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and we of all people are most to be pitied. I think he's exactly right. Mary would be left in her tears without the resurrection. The remaining disciples would have continued in the fog of their grief if not for the resurrection. Instead, because he lives, we are privileged to see as God sees. Because he lives, we're privileged to hope with the heart of God and to love as only God can love. When you turn in the garden of your grief, you will see Jesus and see him for who he is. Don't mistake him for someone else, as Mary did. See him for the one who calls you by name. When you step to the empty tomb of the thousand deaths, you will die before breathing your last. You'll see the burial claws left behind by the risen Lord and know that the resurrection has turned the world upside down. If before you would begrudgingly offer your coat to the one who was cold. Now, because of the resurrection, you offer him your shirt as well. To see as God sees, to live in the kingdom as God lives, to tell time by the resurrection means that the brother who is cold and warmed by your shirt and coat is no inconvenience. He's the fruit of the resurrection and a sign of the coming kingdom. 
By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we who have looked in the empty tomb and heard the Lord of all life breathe our names, we carry the cross. We wash feet. We give when asked without demanding a reason. We visit those in prison. We speak of grace when the world would demand judgment. And we point to Jesus when others say there will be no peace. I I want so much to live that life. I want to tell time by the resurrection and not be bound by my own time. I want that for me. I want that for you. I want that for all of us at Christ Church. Lord Jesus, risen Lord, come and speak my name. Let your resurrection wash over me afresh, like on the day that you rose from the dead, like on the day of my baptism. Teach me to see like God. Teach me to love like the Father. And never again allow me to mistake the empty experience and promise of this world for the wonder, love, and grace of the empty tomb. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We believe in one God. crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Bread, God's peace. Thank you. Peace and welcome to you all. Welcome to Christ Church and thank you for joining us today for our Easter celebrations. We began last night, we've continued through the morning, and in fact this is just the, the first day of Easter. The Easter octave continues through next Sunday. Beginning Tuesday morning we'll have the daily office at 7.30 
excuse me, 7.15 and midday Eucharist at 12.15 in the chapel, feel free to join us as the Easter celebration continues. If you've been in and out of our life at any point in the last six weeks, you know of the hundreds of hands that have made our Lenten and Easter observances possible, musicians, the various guilds that serve here in the nave, those who've kept vigil, those who've made visits and carried the sacrament to those who can't leave their homes to be with us. You know many, if not uh, some of them. Please take a moment in the next day or two to turn to one of them, embrace them, and thank them for making this the community that it is and our Lenten and Easter celebrations possible. It's our custom each year to acknowledge and uh, um, honor one of our local mission partners, ministry partners, or global mission partners. And we do so by designating the Easter Sunday offering. Um, today, we have designated the offering for the benefit of St. George's Baghdad. Uh, this past fall, we had the Vicar of Baghdad come and join us and spend a weekend with us here at Christ Church to tell the story, some of how they minister in downtown Baghdad. As you give today, please give generously and know that it is by your gift we are bound together in ministry with the people of St. George's Anglican Church there in Baghdad. Special welcome uh, this morning to the bishop and to Canon Detweiler for uh, joining us and leading us in worship today. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Bishop. Bless you. Thank you. Ascribe to the Lord the honor due his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light and accessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness. You made all things and fill them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day and beholding the glory of your presence they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven. We acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you love the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior, incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation, to prisoners, freedom, to the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death, and rising from the grave, destroyed death, and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, he sent the Holy Spirit his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world, and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, 
Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup, we praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Catherine, presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, your servant, the Bishop of Tennessee, the cathedral clergy, Timothy, Jean, Joshua, and Dolores, and our seminarians, Gary and Cameron, and all who minister in your church. Remember the men and women of the armed forces at home and abroad, especially Chris, Bradley, and Tony, and all those on active duty from this community, and those who suffer because of war. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember Luca, Sally, Morgan, Jane, Truman, Tom, Nolan, Nora, David, Gertrude, Nina, Fred, John, Mama Lou, Ben, Ellie, Roberta, Carrie, Will, and those we name before God or who are known to God in the silence of our hearts. Remember all who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone, bring them into the place of eternal joy and light. And grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in 
heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Kneel for the Episcopal blessing. Thank you, Fred. May Almighty God, who has redeemed us and made us his children, through the resurrection of his Son, our Lord, bestow upon you the riches of his blessing. Amen. May God, who through the water of baptism has raised us from sin into newness of life, Make you holy and worthy to be united with Christ forever. Amen. May God, who has brought us out of bondage to sin, into true and lasting freedom in the Redeemer, bring us to you, bring you to your eternal inheritance. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever.